Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it's time for another COVID-19 update. The date is... Oh, I have to look it up. What date is it today? <laughs> it's the 20th. Things are moving fast. It's the 23rd of March, 2020. I'm here with Jess Mason. Um, we've been working a lot on the chapter over the weekend and thought we would give you a Monday update as to what is new. And by far the most important piece of news and most important piece of information we have added to the chapter is about chloroquine and azithromycin and the French paper and what did it really say before we start uh, throwing this stuff uh, all over people. So Jess, can you take it away? So in this study that everyone is citing right now, let's go through the facts of what they looked at. So it's a very small study. There was 26 patients who they gave hydroxychloroquine to and 16 controls. And in all of these patients, they were PCR positive for COVID-19, varying severity. So some of them were very mild, some of them were more sick, didn't matter. They gave 26 patients hydroxychloroquine and 16 uh, controls who they compared them to. Now in that hydroxychloroquine group, six of them, just six, also got azithromycin. And then what they did is they looked to see who cleared the virus on PCR several days later, looking at six days as like their primary endpoint. So there's some issues there. Their primary endpoint is clearance of the virus when there's other things that are much more relevant. And here were their results. So of those six patients who got azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine, 100% of them, so six out of six, were PCR negative at day six. The hydroxychloroquine only group 57% of them were negative on day six, and the controls, only 12% of them were negative on day six. So we have to be very cautious in how we interpret this. I know it's getting a lot of media hype right now, and everyone's, I think, feeling hopeful that we have something, and that's a good thing to, to feel hopeful that we potentially have a treatment, but there's a lot of potential problems. We can't jump to conclusions based on literally six patients. I also want to point out, having read the study, that there were six patients in the treatment group that were lost to follow-up, and of those six that were lost to follow-up, two of them were lost because they went to the ICU, and one was lost because they died. So there's some really big question marks here about the safety of these medications, especially when you combine hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin. Both of them are QT prolonging agents. So there's a risk for torsades to points. Now, the uh, deal with the uh, azithromycin is that that was given to people prophylactically um, at the physician discretion. So it's not clear that that is additional in terms of viral clearance. It's maybe just an association. So we have no idea about that. It wasn't randomized. They just, some got it and some didn't. I think really the take home message at this point is everyone hold your horses. We have no idea if this is effective and we also don't know what sort of safety implications there are. So it's good to be hopeful and it's good to be testing and, and studying uh, different treatments. But before we start all hoarding chloroquine and treating patients with it, we really need to be careful about how we go about doing this just because there's a pandemic um, and everyone's, you know, pulling at straws, trying to find something helpful doesn't mean that we should be practicing bad science. And Sean Nort really wants us to know that chloroquine, especially a little less so with hydroxychloroquine, is a potentially very toxic drug. There's cardiac toxicity, but also in kids. If you've got these tablets lying around the house, it only takes a couple of these pills to kill a toddler. So uh, extraordinarily dangerous when given to kids in the wrong dose. So just be careful for yourselves as well out there. So um, I agree. It's interesting. The studies are starting tomorrow, Tuesday here in the United States. There's already studies uh, that are ongoing in other places. And let's wait and see for some randomized data. Now let's go through some of the other updates um, that we've added into the chapter over the weekend, some of the other things you might be hearing about in the news. And one of them is this possibility of an early symptom or just a symptom of COVID-19, which is loss of sense of smell or decreased sense of smell. So that's anosmia. And then I'm going to mispronounce this dysgeusia, dysgeusia, which is decreased taste, which makes sense if you're having decreased um, ability to smell. And data has yet to come out about this, but it's being reported um, as possibly an early sign. And some of the ENT societies are actually recommending that if this is the only symptom that a patient has, that they should actually get screened for COVID-19. Yeah, again, the, the American College of Otolaryngology is suggesting when they look at the data that it appears to be real, it appears to be mostly in young people, and it often occurs in otherwise asymptomatic patients. So they'll probably add that to the list of you know criteria for getting a test. Um, and it's kind of bizarre. Why is this happening? I don't know. 
Yeah, but also very cool if that is an early finding of it. It's a great clue um, to get tested, to self-isolate, if that's the only thing that you have. Yep. So, Jess, uh, there's also some interesting stuff coming out about ultrasound findings. Um, So you've got some pictures that you want to show of that. How we use ultrasound in the algorithm, it's not clear yet, but um, it would probably be good to use ultrasound rather than CT scanning. But I'm not sure you want to ultrasound every single person that comes in because that's going to expose you to a lot of virus. So I don't know exactly how you might use it in the algorithm, but there are some fairly specific findings. Yeah, there are. So we've added more details in this in the chapter as well. Um, The findings on ultrasound tend to be in the posterior lung fields more so than anterior. And another thing that makes ultrasound a potentially helpful modality is that the lesions are peripheral rather than central. Um, So we've added a table into the chapter that compares CT and ultrasound findings. But just to go through what some of these are, um, you may see that the pleural line is thicker than usual and also it looks irregular. You may see B lines. Actually, B lines are the most common early finding, most likely. Subpleural consolidations are also seen and air bronchogram or air bronchiologram sign as well. Um, You could also see some interstitial thickening and edema with localized pleural effusions. So take a look at these images that we've we've created. Our illustrator, Jay, has has made these beautiful ultrasound images. And we've also linked to some that you can see and some videos of what this looks like um, in our chapter. Excellent. Another thing that uh, I added over the weekend, and Jess has edited it for, to make it into English, is that uh, there's IgM, IgG, IgA antibody tests that are available, um, and uh, they are going to become much more available soon. And I think that we're going to start to use these as part of an algorithm of testing. And it would go something like this. Um, for whatever reason, you had a cold a week ago. Uh, you don't know what it is. You're a healthcare worker. Um, You didn't get tested because there weren't PCR tests at the time. Now it's a a week or two later and you're wondering, well, was that COVID? Because if it was and I have IgG antibodies, then I'm almost certainly safe to go to work according to our ID experts. So we might be able to use that in an algorithm. Um, Apparently these are pretty quick, but now we have the rapid PCR tests. Um, I'm not, again, I'm not sure how we might do this, whether you could use one or the other, um, but it certainly would be useful for people knowing that they've um, IgG positive, that they're probably safe to go back to work. We'll also probably use this as screening for convalescent serous studies. So if you've got lots of IgG in your serum after you got in, you know, infected with COVID-19, then uh, there are studies that are ongoing right now about whether giving people that plasma, that convalescent plasma, will also uh, help people who are really sick. So we'll use it for, did you have it? Can you go to work? And did you have it? Should we screen to see how much of a titer you've got so that we might use your serum for somebody else? So uh, much more on that soon. We just sort of put it in there to give you the heads up. I want to add also some of the stuff that we've put in the chapter that Amal has helped us with in terms of the cardiovascular considerations. A number of things. Uh, We are seeing an association with a rise in troponin, so indicating myocardial injury in some patients infected with COVID. And it's not totally clear why that's happening, but it may just be sort of a general inflammatory state leading to more plaque ruptures. We are seeing some cases of heart failure. And of course, patients who tend to get more sick, they're more likely to get heart failure, which makes sense. Um, So stand by for for more updates of how uh, cardiovascular implications play into this whole picture. Uh, But there there does seem to be some things that we should be uh, following closely, especially in patients who already have cardiovascular risk factors. And there's a couple of cases now, they're just one or two scattered cases of people with very impressive EKGs of ST segment elevation, COVID positive, go to the cath lab, no acute lesions. So again, this may be part of that myopericarditis syndrome that we're starting to see. So what about um, for the US docs, Jess, some HIPAA stuff? Because here in the US, they're very anal retentive about, we've got to see you and examine you before we send you away or do anything. And how does COVID change that? Okay, so I'm not an expert in this, but here's what I could find so far. HIPAA and EMTALA are frequent questions that are coming up. And um, in terms of HIPAA, there has been sort of a relaxed interpretation of HIPAA while we're dealing with the pandemic, meaning that we can use things like FaceTime or Skype, whatever means that you can to do a remote video assessment of a patient. 
HIPAA laws are, are relaxed right now so that you can use sort of whatever modality you can pull together to make that telehealth consult, um, to, to be able to perform that telehealth consult. So that's for HIPAA. In terms of EMTALA, and if someone knows more about this, please let us know. But right now, you're still, nothing's changed as far as, as, as I can see. And we've linked um, to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services website that has a posting about this. You're still required to provide a medical screening exam. That does not mean you have to provide a COVID screening exam, but you have to provide a medical screening exam to anyone coming to the emergency department, just like we do all the time. And what uh, they will decide is appropriate may not occur until later. Um, but in a pandemic like this, uh, it's obvious that they're going to have to relax some of those laws. And I know that ASEP and other people are working with the feds to even provide uh, legal protection for emergency physicians during this time, just as they are doing for certain businesses, that they'll do that for emergency physicians, saying like crazy times require crazy things. You can't be suing people because we're just trying to help as many people as we could. So we'll update you as to that as well. You know, a lot of uh, experts and other people are now touching this chapter. We're going to try and give them shout outs in the chapter itself. Um, this has been gone from um, a sort of, let's just get a quick chapter up there to this has become like a full time job for many people. So to everybody working on this chapter and to you out there giving us suggestions. Thank you very much. Mel, I think we should mention uh, something about the co-infection rates. Oh, that's yeah. something that's also changed a lot in the last few days. So we, initially, we thought that co-infection with influenza and other viral illnesses was low, around 2%. Then some new data came out and said, hey, maybe it's more like 5 or 6%. Mel, what are you hearing now? So uh, it appears that it could be even higher than that. It's a little confusing. There's a Chinese study with really sick people from two different hospitals who had IgG positive in uh, 20 to 80 percent of really sick patients. Don't know what to do with that. Had our ID experts look at it and they were like, doesn't really tell you exactly the timing, um, but it might be, you know, um, something that's as your immune system gets squashed, these bugs that are in you start to replicate. Um, so it could be that. Um, it could be um, that it's just likely during a flu season and a COVID season, you get both. You, it's, it's not protective one or the other. The latest information is actually from Stanford, from the ear, and they had co-infection rates as high as 25%. So you were COVID positive and flu positive in about 25% of cases. Again, these are non-peer-reviewed data, and uh, we're not exactly sure what to do with it, but I think there's enough to suggest just because you're flu positive doesn't mean that this person doesn't have COVID as well. So you really do have to test for both. And now we are getting the test. That's probably what will happen. Jess, any other uh, things that you've added to the chapter you want to talk about? We're adding to it constantly. Yeah, constantly, constantly. So there's little things here and there. We've added some um, more updates in terms of pregnancy and breastfeeding. It's, it's nothing drastically different than what was said before. But so far, um, no new data on pregnancy probably a high risk patient population and provider population. And so if you are pregnant and you're, you're a healthcare provider of any type, um, perhaps now is the time to stay home and just be extra cautious. And if you are nursing, there are, if you're breastfeeding, that type of nursing, there are now specific statements from the WHO and the American uh, Breastfeeding Association that say that you can continue to breastfeed. It is most likely protective and only under very unusual circumstances, not unusual, but rare circumstances, is breastfeeding contraindicated. Um, but use a mask, wash your hands, and all, all of the, the typical things if you're COVID positive and breastfeeding a baby. Excellent. And we are doing our next live event um, Wednesday, the 25th of March. Um, we're going to be focusing predominantly on the critical care stuff with Sarah Crager and Scott Weingart. And we're going to get a set of notes from the front line from Swami since he is right in the middle of it as well in New York. So that is Wednesday night, five o'clock Pacific. All right. And uh, Jess and I will update you more if there's anything significant um, whenever it happens. We'll generally do these once a week, but if we need to do it more often, we'll do it more often. So thanks, Jess, for your time. Now get back to editing. <laughs>